In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today's epistle reading finds us here in just at the beginning of the epistle of the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. The Apostle had gone there in, pre in times previous, and he went there preaching the good news that Jesus is the Christ, and the Christ is God, therefore you may be saved. And then, as the Apostle is wont to do, he goes elsewhere. He goes, he continues on his missionary journey. And then something happens to this church in Asia Minor. In this particular church, there comes in what we today call a heresy, the heresy of Judaizing. And this is something that the, that the Apostolic Council decided on. You can read about it in Acts 15. The council was about how is it that Gentiles may become part of the people of God, may become part of the Israel of God. How does this happen? Because for the Jews, it, it was there was a sequence. They were already part of the Mosaic Covenant. They had already undergone circumcision, which is why you hear about circumcision in Acts 15. That's a, um, a case study for a broader question. So this is about how to become part of a covenant with God. And so for, for Jewish people, they had already become part of the Mosaic Covenant, and now, and then they became part of the New Covenant. And this was through baptism. How then should Gentiles be received? This was the big question. How should Gentiles be received? How, uh, how do Gentiles become part of this covenant? And the answer, and I hope I'm not spoiling anything, because I know you've all read Acts before. In Acts 15, they decided the Gentiles are clearly able to become part of this covenant directly. They don't need to become part of the Mosaic Covenant before becoming, uh, be before becoming part of the New Covenant. They can be baptised without being circumcised. And that's how they become part of a covenant with God. That's why it's much, much greater than only a profession of faith. It's becoming part of God's people. But this was not the case with, this was not um, something that the church in Galatia had. We conjecture it's because the epistle to the Galatians was written before this particular council. But regardless, the church in Galatia had other teachers come in. And these other teachers said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second, we, we, we know you like baptism. We know that water's fun. But... You need to become part of the first covenant and then become part of the new covenant. You need to be observing the Mosaic law, all of its 600 commands. This idea of Israel, is, it, it just means that you have more things to do. It doesn't, it, it's not a replacement. Later on in this epistle, and I'm sure we'll go through it in the coming weeks, Paul speaks very, very strongly against this. He asks who has bewitched the people of Galatia. And says in the strongest terms, this is a covenant of grace. You cannot earn this. There's nothing you can do to make this yours. This is about accepting a gift. Not about, not about, um, about quality or marks. And so we find the beginning of this epistle today, where the apostle recounts his own journey to, to the Christian faith. He didn't start off as a Christian. I suppose at that time very few people did. But he certainly didn't. 
where we come across Paul first in, the, in Acts is where he is holding the clothes for people who were throwing rocks at the first martyr of the church. One we know as Stephen. And it doesn't get better after that. He's not just an accomplice. He's not just a clothes hook. But he then goes on to participate in this himself. He then goes on to bring others, others who are, um, others who are following the path of the Nazarene, as we were sometimes called. We talked last week about his conversion on the road to Damascus, how this was so sudden and so shocking to both himself and everyone around him. It changed his life. But it didn't change all of him. You see, he was not entirely evil. He had great zeal, great passion to serve God as he understood him. And so what changed? What changed was not his zeal, was not his passion to follow God. What changed was that this zeal was directed correctly. This zeal was now channeled not in a path that was trying to be for God, but was actually against him. But with this sudden and sharp redirection, the apostle was brought to use this zeal for the sake of advancing the kingdom of heaven, for the sake of following the God that he had always tried to follow, and now he could do so fully, as, um, as fully as he was able. Many of us have come from various backgrounds. Some in, uh, in other professions of, of Christian faith. Some from further outside that. What, this, what today's epistle teaches us is that our past is not irrelevant. It's not, it's not to be blackened from history. We are able to use the, the skills, the habits, the things that we have learnt and are not able and are not to just throw these out, these good habits, these good patterns, but that we are able to use these for God's glory. That we are able to take these things and baptize them and transfigure them. Perhaps we were studious before in learning about our, our subject of choice. And now we learn about divine knowledge, about true wisdom. Perhaps we, look, we, um, perhaps we enjoyed the gym previously and we take lessons from that of perseverance, by incremental gains. Whatever the case may be, we're able to take these and use them for the kingdom. Indeed, we have an obligation. What talents, what talents that we have been given from before time, we can use these, these skills, these abilities, both to share Christ with others, as the Apostle Paul did, as he did in many, many places over his life. And for our own edification, for our own journey towards holiness. So consider what in your life 
would count here. What in your life can be used for glorifying Christ? Whether in your life or through sharing with others. Either way, what in your life can be brought for his glory? Amen.